bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the December 6th, 2022 podcast. This week's episode is another installment in our So You Want to Be a Light Tech Developer series. We launched this series to help real estate developers better understand how the low income housing tax credit is used to finance the acquisition, development, and innovation of affordable rental housing. More particularly, this series is designed for developers seeking to access low income housing tax credits for the first time. That said, this series is also helpful to those with significant housing tax credit experience. And this latter observation or assertion is particularly true for today's episode. We're going to discuss five key steps to helping low-income housing tax credit developers have a successful audit and tax season. Now, our housing tax credit experience developers who are listening might be thinking, why should I listen to this episode? Won't my tax accountant or auditor take care of all of that? That is a good question. Yes, a good low-income housing tax credit accountant can help you navigate and meet your various tax and audit requirements. But I emphasize help you, not do for you. Successful experienced developers know that this isn't just a hand the ball off situation. The developer plays the foundational role in ensuring that a partnership is meeting its tax audit and investor reporting deadlines. Now implementing the five key steps that we'll discuss today will help set you up for success. That success will save you time and money as well as, and perhaps more importantly, help you maintain a good working relationship with your investor and syndicator partners, as well as your lenders. If you don't have experience as a long-term tax credit developer, one thing you do need to bear in mind is tax credit investors generally have accelerated internal reporting deadlines. While a tax credit partnership's federal return of income may not be technically due until March 15th or September 15th if extended, investors have earlier internal deadlines. Also, there's almost universally an audit requirement for tax credit partnerships. Tax credit investors generally have earlier draft tax return deadlines because there are intermediate funds, as well as other reasons for which my guest today will discuss. So if you're looking to be a loan funding tax credit developer, you're going to be involved in ongoing tax and audit requirements for 15 plus years. And that is where our five tips that we're going to discuss today become crucial to know. Now, if you've done a low income housing tax credit transaction already, be sure to listen to all five steps to better ensure you're not missing out on any opportunities to improve during the upcoming tax and audit season. And really, there are five steps and then sub steps within the steps. So you can think of these five points as a checklist, and there's a checklist within the checklist, and you can see how many of these steps you've already taken. Now, joining me in today's discussion is my partner, Christina Apostolidis. She's from our Novogratic Naples, Florida office. Christina was on the podcast just last August. and We discussed taxes and bond market updates. Christina is an accountant, a forecaster, an auditor, a consultant, and has worked on hundreds of transactions involving low-income housing tax credits and tax and bonds. She works with both low-income housing tax credit developers and syndicators, as well as more conventional real estate developers. Christina has a good perspective on comparing and contrasting requirements for tax credit transactions versus those that do not have tax credit financing. So if you're ready, let's get started. Christina, welcome back to Tax Credit Tuesday. Thank you, Mike. I'm happy to be here again. No, I uh, appreciate you joining us. And for those that aren't aware, we are recording this on Monday afternoon. So Christina is working a little bit late in the Florida office. So I appreciate you joining us and accommodating my schedule. So before discussing the five tips, I thought we'd start with a level set for listeners who have developed and operated rental real estate properties, but haven't developed or operated properties financed with low income housing tax credits. I gave a little bit of background in the intro, but maybe Generally speaking, you could share your view on how audit tax and investor reporting requirements for a property finance with low housing tax credits compares to those requirements if you're not receiving tax credit financing. Sure, Mike. Yeah, I think this is a great place to get started. 
um, you know, I think the main difference that developers need to be aware of is who their audience is, right? And anything we need that we're doing, we need to know who our audience is. And in this case, the developers are now partnering with corporate investors. Uh, so timely information is very important to our corporate investors. They partnered together with the developers for the benefit of tax credits and tax losses. Um, so one of the expectations that the investors had of their developers is to provide them with timely information, which is both an audited financial statement um, and tax credit um, tax returns as well for those partnerships, which will deliver the tax credits to them and their losses. So because they're uh, corporate investors, you know, this information getting to them timely is important. They're going to use that information to um, estimate their corporate tax liability and, you know, to meet their own internal financial reporting that they need to do. Um, a lot of our investors are banks, um, and so there's a lot of um, banking regulations and internally that they have to meet. Uh, so these, that's, that's what makes these, um, you know, deadlines uh, very important um, because of who their partner is. And also uh, the developers are reporting because they're in a partnership with their syndicator and their investor. And the investor and syndicator are there to also make sure that um, the rules are being met. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've done these, the series of, so you wanna be a LIHTC developer and we've seen how complex LIHTC rules can be. There's a lot of them. And so there'll be a lot in the series here, um, but there's, there's very complex rules. And that's why the syndicators and investors want this information earlier. Um, so, you know, some of these deadlines where we're used to having, you know, the developers might be used to having a March 15 deadline for their partnership return. The investors are going to want that information earlier, so they have time to review it, make sure the rules are being met, make sure tax filing is done properly. There's a lot that, um, you know, maybe things can get missed, and that's what the investors and syndicators are there for. Uh, just last week, I was talking with a syndicator, um, and they had a, a LIHTC partnership that's in their portfolio where they missed making a 168 election. Um, so, you know, things happen, and that's why the investors are there. That That's why they have these accelerated deadlines. So that's very specific to these uh, LIHTC partnerships that a developer might not be used to. Um, so thank you for that. I can't help but follow up with, you mentioned a Section 168 election. <laughs> so maybe just to wet the whistle, if you will, of some of our listeners, what is that? Yeah, so the, the 168 election is important uh, for partnerships that are generally uh, managed and or owned by a nonprofit, um, making the 168 election allows that partnership to use a more accelerated depreciation life. Um, otherwise, they'd be subject to the nonprofit uh, lives, which are longer. Uh, so the result of the partnership not making the 168 election meant that the partnership was delivering less depreciation expense, which meant less losses for the investor. And again, because the investors are very, you know, they're, they're um, investing in light tech partnerships, one for the credits, but also for losses. You know, they look, they measure these two to see what their internal rate of return, and that's what they make their investments based on. Um, so if anything changes from what they thought of, their rate of return is going down. It, you know, it's not going to be as beneficial as they originally thought. So again, super important um, to that, you know, that specific is why these, you know, reporting and deadlines are a lot sooner because there's a lot of people looking at these to make sure that we're, the project is delivering what it promised to the investor. Now, it's, a, it's good to emphasize the fact that investors are seeking tax benefits and namely tax credits and tax losses. And it's not just getting a certain dollar amount of tax credits and tax losses over the life of the investment. The sooner you get those tax benefit or tax losses from a temporal perspective, the more valuable they are. And, and without such an election that you were mentioning, the losses get pushed out so they become slightly less valuable, which ultimately makes its way back into equity pricing. But anyways, we, we, we went down really deep there. Let's take a step way back <laughs> and 
that was really a good discussion about the the general importance or the enhanced importance of the, the tax and audit season for a tax credit investor slash syndicator. Now let's talk about the tips, the five tips that you have for how housing tax credit developers can have a successful audit and tax season. So if you get to list them in a bridge form, then we'll discuss each one in more detail. Sure, Mike. Yeah, from my experience, and, and I have the benefit of, of working with developers, but also with syndicators. So um, I can see, you know, when we're working at the syndicator side, you know, we're interested in making sure that we, we're getting all those audits and tax returns in um, to do the syndicator reporting, audits and tax returns at the syndicator level. Um, and we can't proceed unless we get that information in. So from my experience, you know, developers who are most successful in meeting those investor deadlines are gonna do these five items, right? So these are the five that usually makes, you know, that developer most successful. Um, and the first one, number one, is uh, to hire an experienced accountant. Uh, number two is to establish a timeline uh, with the signed responsibilities to meet reporting deadlines. So this is developer and their accountants um, and, and the individuals responsible to, um, you know, engaged in doing the reporting, you know, assigning responsibilities and coming up with a timeline to, to make sure they're meeting the investor deadlines. Um, and then number three is to establish a mechanism for ongoing communication. And this is mainly to monitor the progress. So we'll get into some of the, you know, subtopics in here on how to do that. But Again, super important where, you know, our focus is to meet the deadlines, um, to kind of continue that relationship with the investor. Um, and so we want to constantly make sure we know where uh, the projects are and are they going to meet those deadlines or do we need to change course on anything? Um, and the number four is to be alert for surprises and share them early. Again, all about communication. If something comes up, during the audit or a tax period that's going to cause a delay or any changes in original expectations that the investor might have had, we want to communicate these early. And the number five is to prepare and discuss an after action report. So this would be after um, everything's submitted, we met the deadlines, uh, we're always looking to do better because again, things happen and also our developers are constantly doing new projects, right? So the more we add on to the workload, we still wanna be able to continue to meet those deadlines. Great, thank you for that, Christina. I appreciate you outlining those five steps, which are in a chronological order in terms of how they should be addressed in the course of the busy season. Uh, but the first tip that you mentioned is engaging a knowledgeable accountant. And I think when we're thinking of knowledgeable, we mean a knowledgeable tax credit accountant, and not only just a knowledgeable tax credit accountant, but a knowledgeable tax credit accountant in the states in which you're developing tax credit housing. And I totally obviously agree with that tip. And I don't agree with it just because we're an accounting and consulting firm that's knowledgeable, uh, but more because the local tax credit has particular requirements and nuances, as we discussed earlier with the 168 election. So if you're a developer, you definitely want to work with an accountant who understands the low income tax credit incentive. And if you're using private activity bonds, you know, that accountant that also is familiar with private activity bond financing. If you have various HUD financings, then you would want to know, work with an accountant that's experienced with the Department of Housing and Development Programs. You know, in short, you want to look for a CPA firm that has successfully navigated audits and tax return preparation for the types of long term tax transactions that you're working on. So that's my broad overview in terms of riffing a bit <laughs> on your pointing out number one is having an experienced tax credit accountant, but maybe you could expand Christina on why an experienced CPA is so valuable. Yeah, so like you mentioned, you know, there's complexity in following the LIHTC rules, um, but an experienced accountant will um, be able to identify issues as well um, and be able to work together with the developer to resolve um, issues that come up. 
um, as well as working with the investors or syndicators. Uh, so if you know, you know, if you know the rules, you'll be able to navigate them a lot easier. So that's super important. Um, also, you know, maybe things happen with a particular entity and um, again, we're, we're reaching out for ways to resolve um, maybe certain issues that might happen or, or things might might have gotten missed. We can help fix things at the partnership level. Um, you know, we're particularly in the first years, we're looking at, you know, making the, the required elections. We talked about the 160H election, but there's a lot of others too. So you need your accountants to know and have gone through, a, you know, many successful filings as well to know when to resolve issues and know what to look out for. Okay. Another thing that I think is very important that the developer should keep in mind when engaging a CPA is to ask them and, and to understand what is their commitment and their capacity to meet investor deadlines. Um, you want to understand that that CPA firm is committed, understands the deadlines um, that are required of the entities that will be audited and the tax returns that will be prepared and that they have the capacity to do it as well and to, to meet those deadlines. Um, and then another thing that's also important is, you know, what is that CPA firm's relationship with the syndicators and investors that the developer is dealing with? Um, one thing, you know, this is the time of year the um, syndicators start reaching out and I just had a call today with one of our syndicators reaching out, you know, you know, they want to understand, you know, what's, you know, which are our new projects, what's the status, you know, and, and it's just, I've worked with them for many years um, and, and it's just, it's a nice time to catch up with them. You know, we let each other know, you know, where we are and maybe if I had questions or they have particular questions. So we do have a really, I feel like with the syndicators I work with, I have a good relationship and I, and I think that goes a long way because if an issue does arise, you know, there's that open channel of communication as accountants and the CPA firm, you know, we can a lot of times help maybe resolve issues between the developer and investor when issues come up or, or help them understand the rules on both sides. Um, so I think that that goes a long way. So just understanding what the <coughs> CPA firm's relationship is um, also makes the process a lot easier. And I would also just add that in addition to the CPA that you're working with being experienced, uh, if they are part of a firm that has experience across the board with tax credit accounting, then as issues do arise, if, if there's something new, there's a good chance the firm itself is already thinking about the issue. Uh, and every year there's new guidance comes out, new interpretations and the rest. So it's definitely something where even if you have experience from the year before, new issues could have arisen. So it's a question not only having experience in the past, but also be very engaged uh, in the tax credit field so you're staying current on new issues. So thank you for that. Now let's turn to the second tip in your list, and that's to set a timeline that includes investor deadlines and requirements as well as specifically assigning the responsibilities for each of the tasks. Basically, what's the accounting firm responsible for? What's the developer responsible for? And then naming names within each of those groups for portions of the task. And I do really like this tip. It's the strategy of beginning with the end in mind. I've mentioned this on the podcast in previous episodes, but I do think it's worth repeating here. The general idea is that if you don't know where you're going, you'll never know if you've arrived, much less know how you'll get there. So let's break this tip down for listeners. Christina, what are the types of deadlines that you think developers should include in their plan? What are some of these various benchmarks? Yes, Mike, um, correct. We have to, where we start, what's the end game, right? So the first thing, um, you know, very important as part of our planning meetings is just laying out when is everything due um, and really looking at um, the particular investor or syndicator that a project is um, in or 
also um, looking at um, the partnership agreements as well and any other guidelines that the syndicators might be providing to their developers as far as timeline. Um, so two things you have to keep in mind. Some syndicators, investors will require draft deadlines. Um, so like we mentioned, they want to review everything. They want to make sure that the tax returns are being prepared properly or if there's any issues that they identify on the financial statements. Um, so they need enough time to review those. So you want to be very clear as to what those draft deadlines are. They're not always the same for every syndicator and investor. We've seen some as early as January 30th. Um, maybe some early in February or February 15th, where syndicators want that information and to give them again enough time to review. So laying out those deadlines and then working backwards, right? Um, we want to put on the developers, you know, we want to let them know how much time do we need to get that audit done as the auditors. Um, so we will you know, let work with the developers to, to gain an understanding and making sure that everybody's on the same page. You know, we need their information by a certain date so that we can turn around and deliver audits and tax returns to them. Um, so, you know, all of this gets done in our planning meetings. Um, you know, we're up front, we have our schedules, we lay everything out, we know our deadlines, and then we subsequently work together with the developer to discuss when do we need their information um, and what that information is. You know, we can't just say, you know, give us your information. <laughs> we need to be very uh, specific and clear as to, you know, what are the documents that we need to review. Um, communicate that with them um, and, and have that, uh, again, there are certain schedules that might need to be prepared. Some of them, um, the developers might engage the accountants to prepare as part of the audit, um, certain schedules and certain information, maybe depreciation schedules, um, but some of them might, you know, client or developers might prepare these on their own. So again, being very clear as to who's providing what information. Um, I mentioned a little bit about you know, reading the LPA. Um, so as part of your planning process um, to lay out, you know, you need to understand each specific LIHTC partnership. Every partnership might be, every partnership is a different transaction, has different financing, um, different, um, maybe different tax credits. Some ha might have solar credits this year or some might be historic credits and all that affects how, how the project's going to be audited and what tax schedules are going to be prepared. Um, if it's a HUD project, there might, there'll be additional different audit standards to follow. So again, reading through the LPA is as much a responsibility of the developer as, as it is of the accountants as well. So the developer should know, okay, this is what needs to be done for this entity. Um, some things that we have seen, you know, on the syndicator side where, you know, we're waiting for audits, it, you know, sometimes um, some LIHTC partnerships and CPA firms realize, oh, there was a, you know, some government financing and that, that'll delay the audit. Right. So, you know, if they find this out a little bit, you know, too late, you know, or during tax season, um, it wasn't planned for. So, you know, they can't deliver an audit on time. So all these things are uh, very important. Um, another tip in, in this, you know, about setting your timeline and your plan. Um, I always start with the harder transactions. Right. So I, you know, I push my clients to, OK, let's start on those projects that are first year audits or there was some significant transaction that might have happened during the year. Um, again, you know, we can plan for a lot of things, but, you know, sometimes when you're actually in the weeds and doing the work, you might find, um, you know, some nuances or something that you didn't think of before. So if you're, we're starting with those more complex transactions, as those are the first ones we're going to tackle in our timeline. Uh, we give ourselves more time to address any issues that come up. So I think that's very important. Um, and then also as you're, you know, reading through your LPA and thinking about all your entity lists for this year, um, you know, another thing to think about is any changes in tax law and maybe how they affect reporting uh, for the current year. Last year we had um, 
some changes in investor reporting when it comes to investors K-1s. So we, the, the IRS added schedules K-2 and K-3, um, which added some time and delivery of tax returns. Um, so again, knowing these items ahead of time and tax law changes every year, <laughs> keeps us in business, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, it's not just the accountants that need to be aware of these, you know, you want to have these discussions with the CPA firm that you're engaged in and, you know, are they aware of these new changes coming down the road and, and how are they going to handle it, right? How are they going to, how is this going to affect delivery? Well, so. well, thank you for that because it really is an iterative process where you need to be thinking through what all has to get done. And as you say, starting with the deadlines and going back from there and then triaging and layering in all the different tasks. And it's, it's something that you probably can't spend too much time doing. It, I always draw the analogy, and we talked about this when we were preparing for the podcast. It's sort of like whenever I have a painting project at home, I always want to start painting. <laughs> and every time I engage in a painting project, I always end up at the end saying, I really should have done a lot more taping and masking and preparing so that the actual painting part would have been a lot faster and quicker and the product would have been better. So I, I can't encourage uh, developers enough to do a lot of advanced planning, do a lot of advanced thinking. Uh, and, you know, an ounce of planning will save pounds of uh, time in the process. So once a developer and the accountant does have a timeline in place with assigned responsibilities, what are some of the tips that you have for executing the plan? Yeah, so we, as we discussed, you know, deadlines for our LIHTC reporting, audited financial statements and tax returns, they come up pretty quick, right? So year end is, you know, December 31st and some of these reporting deadlines are hitting right at the end of January and very early in February. Um, so some of the tips that, you know, we see that make some of the, the process go a lot smoother is working with your CPA firm and trying to get as much work done. Um, now, December is here, <laughs> uh, the end of year has come, but as much as it can get done before the end of the year um, and then very early in January as possible. Um, and we'll discuss this sort of at the end where we have our recommendation of, you know, setting sort of a plan of, of kind of revising and what can we do better next year. Um, but, you know, some things that can get done, you know, now in December, you know, developers should be reviewing their books and records, making sure they recorded all of last year's adjustments. <laughs> so that you know, again, goes a long way. It saves a lot of time, a lot of questions during the actual field work, um, like we call it, of the audit process, um, making sure they're accruing. These are gap financial statements. These are, you know, should be on the accrual basis for both audit and tax. And so they want to make sure that they're accounting for all their accruals. Uh, recording any related party fees as well, um, you know, looking at their partnership agreements, what fees are there, um, you know, there's partnership fees, there might be incentive management fees, all these, you know, they want to be looking at this and making sure they're recording these so that their records are complete. Um, and also waterfall calculations, you know, our clients, you know, the ones that are successful, they're they're doing this before the end of the year and not after, um, and making sure that if there's any payments that could be made um, from cash flow, that those are being prepared, looked at, and you know, properly paid at the right time. Um, the other thing, you know, when we looked at our list of entities with the developers, um, we want to. You know, sometimes some syndicators might uh, be able, might waive an audit requirement. Um, so again, depends on the specific entity, uh, especially if it's a new deal, no tax credits are being developed. There's not much by way of operations. So maybe it's a first year, you know, act rehab where, you know, maybe the investor came in late in the year. So there were the, that partnership is not delivering much by way of losses or credits yet. Um, the investors might be 
willing to waive an audit requirement. So again, understanding your entities and, and if that's the situation for a particular entity, the developer should be proactive in requesting a waiver. Um, the the syndicator is not automatically going to waive it. You can't make that decision on your own. You have to make sure that you involve them and ask them. Um, but a lot of times they're willing to waive certain audit requirements. Um, but again, so that helps the developer and the audit team focus on right. you know which ones are important, right? We don't want to do something that's you know not necessarily required. Um, and then just some other tips for executing the plan. Um, you know, again. We do a lot of planning, we have a lot of meetings and discussions, but you know, we need the developers to be proactive with the accountants to communicate um, significant things that might have happened. You know, was there a casualty event? Um, you know, some of these things we not we may not see, you know, it might not be, you know, blaring on a trial balance that we receive. So we need some additional information from our developers to communicate that. Um, were there transfers? Um, was there an investor transfer um, that we might that we need to be aware of? Because if there was, we might need to record extra calculations on the tax return. And again, if we're finding this out after maybe we drafted, again, there's gonna cause it's gonna cause a delay in the reporting process. So again, significant issues, any lawsuits, transfers, refinances, you know, any compliance issues that might have come up. Again, we need to know these early. So that's a really good point to emphasize any significant events that happened in the course of the uh, current year or the year under audit, obviously as well as into the next year in terms of uh, notable sort of events so they can be adequately addressed and those are the types of matters that can be addressed earlier and we'd much rather address them in December than in uh, early February <laughs> right. when you have a February deadline. So the third tip that you mentioned is establishing a process for ongoing communication uh, with the audit and tax teams and with investors, potentially lenders, you know, the developer, of course, being at the center of that communication process. What are some of the examples or some of the ways that you end up communicating with your clients uh, to help ensure, you know, they're, that both sides are aware where you're in the process and who's responsible for what? Yeah, so what we find works best, especially between now and through the point when we've delivered all drafts and finals to the investors is having a weekly call. And a weekly can be, you know, it depends what, what works for the team, weekly or bi-weekly, but something that's happening pretty regularly. Um, having these calls, again, we can catch up on who's doing what, you know, just to clarify, things sometimes get, you know, we want to make sure whose court the ball is in, right? And sometimes it's not very clear. Um, but so these weekly calls just help, you know, everybody stay, um, you know, on top of, of what's going on and where things are um, in the process. So definitely I would recommend, you know, scheduling those and, and having them regularly. Um, the other thing too, and, and now technology is great. You know, I feel like um, there's a lot of tools out there where we can see live status information, you know, between the accountants and the developers, um, whether it's um, using it for status, like delivery dates, or tracking things that are due between each other, right? So you want to use it for both, particularly here at our firm, we use Smartsheet, um, which we love now because, again, Everybody's seeing it live, um, which keeps everybody, you know, again, abreast of what's going on and when the things are happening. So there's less of this email having to go back and forth, you know, every, it's all live on one sheet. Um, but there's other tools out there. So whatever works for your team, um, definitely something along those lines where everybody has access. Um, also, another thing that we find helpful too is, um, developers books and records certain software um, that developers you know may be using might have a version where they can give the auditors restricted access to certain documents um, I think the developers appreciate this um, and their internal accounting teams because the auditors then don't 
have to maybe ask them for information. The auditors have access to, oh, you know, if we're reviewing a certain account and something pops up at us and we want some extra information, um, the auditors can go out, pull invoices or look at some of the trans the behind the transaction um, information. So it can pull information such as rent rolls, leases, um, subsidiary ledgers. So again, it gives the auditors sort of more at their fingertips information versus having to wait for somebody to provide that. Um, so definitely something that um, developers want to look into their software and see if because that, that'll definitely make the process go a lot smoother. Um, so thank another, you. For that. Did you yep. say nothing, something else you wanted to add? Yeah, just um, just a last thing too, as part of the communication process, you also want to make sure you know who's communicating to the investor. <laughs> Again, that that's the um, the whole important part here. Um, investors might have different ways they want information received, so you want to know, okay, is it the uh, CPA firm that's delivering that information and uploading it, right? There's portals, people have emails. Um, so it's all, you know, might be different, but again, that should be part of your communication strategy of who's, who's ultimately delivering that information to the investors. Great. Thank you for that, Christina. And then the fourth tip in your list is to keep an eye out for any surprises that may arise and discuss them sooner than later. Uh, with your investors and syndicators. So obviously the whole purpose of all the advanced planning <laughs> is to try to avoid surprises. The whole purpose of, you know, asking about extraordinary events like refinancings, transfers, casualties, you know, uh, occupancy issues, things of that nature are trying to avoid surprises, but inevitably uh, surprises, you know, can arise. So maybe you could describe the types of issues that uh, you've seen arise in the course of an audit and the importance of discussing them early with your accountants as well as investors and syndicators. Right, and and again, just I wanted the developers to understand that, you know, the syndicators and investors are there as partners and, you know, they want to be made aware of issues early because they want to be able to help resolve you know, the sooner an issue comes up, um, the more chances we'll be able to find a solution um, and involve more parties in that discussion. Um, so kind of the two areas where we see, you know, issues um, where something needs to be resolved. Um, and generally it's because it's gonna cause a change to the tax credits, right? Or the tax credit delivery and timeline. Um, so generally issues might arise during the construction and lease up period. And so generally we're seeing it in our first year audits and first year tax returns. Um, so especially particularly now um, with COVID and a lot of the delays in construction and shortages, we're seeing a lot of construction delays. Um, and so definitely communicating if you're going to deliver less credits than you had anticipated um, in your partnership agreement, that's something you want to communicate to the investor. They need to make the appropriate adjustments on their side. Are there any adjusters that are due um, as a result? Um, so definitely that's one um, that you want to, and, and sometimes, you know, the these are the ones that happen that are getting placed in service very at the end of the year, right? So they maybe they were anticipated to have get placed in service in June, but because of delays and, and construction, you know, it keeps getting pushed and they say, oh, we're going to meet it. We're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to place in service. We're going to lease out. But if, if it slips, you know, so these happen towards the end of the year. Um, and then the other might be compliance issues. You know, sometimes again, like we do our planning, we ask the questions, but inevitably some something might come up that might cause a compliance issue. Um, again, we need um, enough time to resolve these. So these are the ones that we would just want to make sure. And again, it, it involving and, and bringing these up early just gives us more time to find a strategy to to you know what works best, right? What works best for everybody and how to resolve something. So thank you for that. Now turning to your fifth and final tip, and in some ways we're kind of going full circle here, 
because the fifth and final tip is to, is to prepare and discuss an after action report, which is an effort designed to discuss what went well. So you keep doing the following year, what went well, and also identify areas for improvement. We mentioned earlier how this really is a more than 15 year partnership. Uh, so you'll end up having this reporting cycle go on for generally more than 15 years because you have, you have your development phase and your lease up phase. Uh, so this ends up being the bookend to the first tip off setting a plan. Uh, this is, you know, kind of at the end where you've finished the work and now you're looking at how well you did and thinking about ways to improve in the following year. So in your experience, you know, what are some of the questions that you think developers should be asking at this wrap up meeting or as part of this after action report, or, you know, maybe said differently, what are the areas that you want to make sure that you discuss with the developer so that the process can be improved for the following year? Yeah, having these meetings are great. Um, and I would also recommend having them as soon as busy season or tax season is over. Good point. Uh, <laughs> when it's fresh in your I, mind. Right, exactly. You know, you 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 quickly forget the pain. <laughs> so, and that's just, I think, human nature. But um, definitely while it's fresh in everybody's mind, you know, some of the things that I discuss with my clients are, you know, we go over adjustments. So as auditors, while we're doing the audit, you know, we'll propose adjustments. Uh, we'll go through those, making sure, um, is there anything in their internal control processes that can be changed um, or implemented um, to avoid the auditors having to propose an adjustment? You know, and some things, you know, are a quick and easy tweak in their process. Um, maybe it's another schedule they need to be preparing as part of their management reports. Um, but, you know, so, you know, we find that you know, a lot of times our developers are very receptive to making these changes because they do want the process to go quicker. Um, and those are the developers, again, that have these good, successful tax seasons. Yeah. Um, also, you know, we talk about um, the possibility of performing interim work, right? Before we talked about doing as much as you can now in December, um, you know, but we can start earlier. You know, the accountants can start earlier. Um, some, some of my clients, uh, what I do is, is request a September trial balance from them. Um, and I do this particularly with newer, newer clients in LIHTC or sometimes maybe some of our clients, there was changes in personnel, um, in their accounting department. So, you know, we want to do a quick, you know, analytical review, um, our transactions being posted properly, um, uh, and taking a look and seeing, seeing what can be done maybe in the, in the fourth quarter or earlier on. Yeah, and then I think- oh, okay. No, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Continue, please. I was just saying the last thing too at this meeting is, is to look ahead, right? So what what's projects are in their pipeline, right? It's never too early to start planning a cost certification. Um, I, we definitely stress our clients, if you have a projects that, that's being placed in service now in the current year, uh, when can we start planning that cost certification to get it done way before busy season hits? So, Thank you for that. I was just going to mention, I kind of described this as prepare and discuss an after action report, almost as if it was the end, but really it's something that you're in the course of meeting your deadlines and complying with your timeline and the weekly calls, you know, as, far, as part of updating Smartsheet. There should be this like running list of next time <laughs> i'm going to reorder it uh, in this other fashion uh, so that it will be a little bit more efficient a little bit more effective so it is something that is you know it's something you're keeping track of throughout the course of the busy season so that when it does when you do meet your various filing deadlines your your list of tips and ideas is uh, fresh at hand Oh yeah, we keep we keep a little, kind of running little note on our side, yeah. and anytime we think of something, we just jot it down. And we're not going to bother them, you know, our developer clients, that, you know, during busy season. But we we definitely have it there as soon as tax season's over to go through things with them. So we ran through five uh, tips to have a more successful uh, tax and audit season and investor reporting season. I'm curious to know what other tips or sub tips or parts of the five tips 
do you might want to share with developers before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I think the most, you know, kind of just the overall um, tip would be, um, you know, communicating issues because I feel like, and it's particularly on our, you know, new deals, um, things get delayed and the syndicators and investors are there um, to help. And I think that if you communicate, even even if you're, you're not going to meet the deadline, things happen, um, I think the investors and syndicators are aware of that. They can manage those expectations on their side as long as they know ahead of time. So I feel like developers sometimes are afraid to communicate any bad news, but, um, but at the same time, I think you kind of build that trust with the investor if you're, com if you're being upfront um, with them. So I think that's the one takeaway the developers should just be aware of is just, you know, communicate, you know, whatever it is, any, any changes in expectations, let the syndicators be involved in any decisions that need to be made and, and just so that they can adjust their expectations. Um, you know, we find that when, when that's done, um, you know, the process goes easier because maybe there's a certain reason the audit can't get done. Things happen. A lot of things, you know, some changes or something might happen, a financing issue, and sometimes the audit can't be completed. But if the investors are aware of that, you know, then you can make adjustments to your right. timeline. So. So thank you for all of that. And thank you for those five tips. I'll just repeat them again. Hire an experienced accountant, number one, and that's an experienced tax credit accountant uh, in the state in which you have developments. Number two, establish a timeline or schedule with assigned responsibilities. Number three, establish mechanisms for ongoing communication to monitor, to monitor the schedule and ensure nothing slips through the cracks. Uh, number four, be alert for surprises. And when you discover them, share them early. Uh, the sooner you discover them and share them, the more likely and the more readily a solution will be found. And then five, at the end of busy season, prepare and discuss an after action report so you can improve the process for the next year. And those are five tips, but I'll actually challenge our listeners now. Uh, if you have any tips or recommended practices that we haven't mentioned in today's podcast, feel free, not even feel free, please tweet them to me. No, feel free to tweet them to me. Please tweet them to me. My handle on Twitter is at Novogratic. I would love to hear from you. And Christina, I want to thank you again for sharing your top five tips and for staying a little bit later on the East Coast. Now, please do stick around to the end of the podcast for our off mic section, where I get to ask you for some fun off topic advice and recommendations. Great. It's my pleasure, Mike. Always looking towards busy season and how to make it better. So I hope this helps a lot of our developer listeners. I'm sure that it will. And looking ahead to next week's podcast, our episode will be a must listen for anyone who's planning to apply for new Marcus Tesla allocation in the next round, as well as, you know, any potential business borrower that's looking to receive new market tesh credit subsidized financing. As you may have heard, and you will have heard if you subscribe to the Novogratic free breaking news service, applications for the calendar year 2022 round for new market tax credits are due January 26th, 2023. This round is currently authorized at up to $5 billion in new market tax credit allocation issuance authority through a fairly competitive application process. Joining me next week, my partner, Nicola Pinoli, uh, will be on the show to discuss ways to get a competitive edge on your new markets tax credit application. We're gonna talk about scoring strategies and which questions you wanna pay particularly close attention to, as well as how to choose which businesses or projects in your pipeline are best to include in your application. You can make sure that you're notified of next week's episode and each week's episode by following and subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast. Simply go to www.novaco.com slash podcast to subscribe to and stream the show on our website. You can also follow or subscribe to Tax Credit Tuesday on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Radio Public. And also, if you're watching this podcast, then you're watching us on YouTube because we did recently 
start sharing the podcast on YouTube. And now we reach our off mic section where I ask our guests some off topic advice and words of wisdom. So Christina, my first question is a popular question for podcast guests. What's the most important leadership lesson that you've learned and beyond discuss the lesson itself, maybe describe how you found it to be valuable. Yeah, I think that when I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, what, um, what's the most important lesson? But I think most recently I've come across is that you, you often might have to be a different leader or different leadership style, depending on who you're maybe mentoring or who you're working with. Um, I think maybe earlier in my career, I was used to maybe changing my style depending on who I was working for. Um, and now, you know, sort of, you know, being in a leadership role, you know, I'm finding that it's also equally as important to change your leadership style with who you're developing. Um, and, you know, I, I maybe didn't realize that at first, you know, I think sometimes you think this is my leadership style and this is how I am. Um, but when you're thinking of how important it is to develop um, upcoming um, other colleagues in the industry with you and at the firm, I think it's important to keep in mind that not everybody is receptive to the same leadership style. Um, and, and you find, I find value in it, you know, when you see people grow and, you know, improve. I think everybody is in the learning process, even myself. Um, and so I think when you you're lead you're leading to where somebody's at and what they need um you'll you'll help them grow and i and i can see that uh, more recently with um, some of the people that i'm working with so just kind of changing your leadership style so thank you for that i really like how you uh observed how as someone who was working with others earlier in your career you yourself would adjust to to them and their leadership styles and learning that, you know, as, as a leader, you know, maybe it isn't incumbent just on the person who you're leading to adjust their interaction. It's up for you to adjust it as well. So I, I like the 180 degree aspect of that. So I uh, thank you for that. It's a great tip. So my uh, other question, and I'll only ask you two, oftentimes I go three, but uh, it is later in the day for you than it is for me. So my uh, second last question is particularly timely, considering the time of year, given the variety of work deadlines that we have, as well as holiday and events with family and friends. Uh, it's a particularly busy time of the year, and it's busy in some ways in a different way. It's not busy like busy season, where it's, pre where it's pretty focused on the business side. It's busy in a work-life balance way. What is your favorite or one of your favorites? I mean, it's always hard to say what is the favorite, but what's one of your favorite work-life balance tips? Yeah, when I'm trying to balance work and life, you know, I found that my to-do calendar and my work calendar, I'll put my, you know, some of my family events on there, you know, particularly the ones that I can't miss. Um, you know, my son has a Christmas concert this Thursday, you know, so we need to make sure that we don't forget about that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I will oftentimes combine both my calendars. Um, again, you don't want to miss something. Family is just as important and we need to be there for them. Um, but also at the beginning of every month too, I go through, we have our calendar at home on the refrigerator and that has all the the family activities on there. I make sure to update that um, and go over it with everybody, but it's in a spot where everybody can see it. Um, so those are kind of my two tips, you know, just kind of, you know, combining your calendars. Again, you don't want to miss something. And then also just kind of updating it right month by month, putting everything out there that's coming up. So. Well, I really love the idea of printing out because in this area of technology, all the rest, it's a, a bit of an old school, even though you're probably printing out something that isn't old school and then putting it out there publicly for everyone to see and weigh in on and, and audit and all the rest. So that's a, a really good tip. But tell me a little bit more about the concert on Thursday. Is it singing? Is it instruments? Is it 
Um, it's pre it's a little bit of both. Each grade does their own, you know, piece. Most of it is singing. Some of the grades, um, our school has a steel drum uh, <laughs> group, which is which is really nice. So to hear Christmas music on steel drums sounds very Florida, <laughs> but <laughs> and it is, and it is. Uh, so yeah, it, it's always a nice time. They do. Our music director at school does a great job. Um, she's been there for years and she really enjoys it um, working with the children. So it's a, it's a nice time and it's live stream too. That's the good thing about technology. So my family that lives far away can watch it. So they enjoy that as well. Well, I do enjoy it on Thursday. My children are all uh, out of, uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're still in college, but they're all out of uh, elementary, junior high and high school. And I, for years and years and years, I always would look forward to those annual uh, holiday uh, events uh, in the month of December. And I, I look back very fondly on those. So enjoy creating good memories this Thursday. Thank you. We will. So thank you again, Christina. And to our listeners, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company, LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes. You can find related links referenced in this podcast in our show notes at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast. Novogratik and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.